These days, most people find nuclear bombs terrifying, and for good reason. If someone told you where and when a nuclear bomb would be going off, your first instinct would probably be to get as far away from there as possible. While this fear has been pervasive in societies all over the world since the atom bomb's inception, there have been attempts to make it seem less scary, more appealing, and even as a source of wonder. So pack your bags, because we're taking a trip to the atomic city as we learn something new. On April 22nd, 1952, about 200 reporters from across the United States gathered on a mound of volcanic rock on the edge of Yucca Lake in Nevada. The journalist and cameraman were there to witness the detonation of a nuclear bomb on United States soil. These sort of tests had been in operation for more than a year at this point, but for the first time, the press had been invited to record and broadcast the nuclear explosion. The journalist's post was only 10 miles from ground zero, giving Americans from the safety of their living room a front seat proxy to the explosion. One journalist, writing for the Washington Bulletin, described witnessing the blast. You put on the dark goggles, turn your head, and wait for the signal. Now, bomb has been dropped. You wait the prescribed time, then turn your head and look. A fantastically bright cloud is climbing upward like a huge umbrella. You brace yourself against the shock wave that follows an atomic explosion. A heat wave comes first, then the shock, strong enough to knock an unprepared man down. Then, after what seems like hours, the man-made sunburst fades away. The 31 kiloton bomb, nicknamed the Big Shot by the press and Charlie by the Atomic Energy Commission, was enormous when compared to the 13 kiloton and 20 kiloton bombs that the United States had dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, Japan during World War II. The broadcast of the explosion awed Americans and officially touched off the atomic craze that swept the nation, for which Las Vegas was merely 65 miles away. Americans were in the midst of the Cold War building bomb shelters and practicing air raid drills. When President Harry Truman selected 640 square miles in Nevada, once part of the Nellis Air Force Base, as the Nevada Proving Grounds, the only peacetime above ground nuclear testing site in the continental United States. It had been deemed necessary to conduct tests on nuclear devices in order to develop sufficient protection should similar devices be used against Americans. But let's rewind a bit before the Cold War, World War II, and World War I. Back to when a small gathering of ranches that had sprouted up in the hot Nevada desert decided to incorporate into the city of Las Vegas, with a population of just around 3,000, just one year after Nevada had outlawed gambling. From its inception, gambling was done in speakeasies and illicit casinos, run by groups willing to break some laws in order to get rich. By the time gambling was legalized in 1931, organized crime had spread throughout the city. Soon, it would have a massive boom with the construction of the massive Boulder Dam, which would go on to be renamed the Hoover Dam, being constructed just east of Las Vegas. At its completion, Vegas had cheap hydroelectricity to power its early flashing signs. Massive resorts and casinos were popping up along a section of highway that would later be known as the Strip. They booked top-tier talent for their ceremonies and did everything they could to make the desert look like the most appealing place on Earth throughout the 1940s. As its potential became clear, investors from Wall Street banks, union pension funds, and even the Mormon church, as well as investments from members of organized crime, began to flood into the city. Las Vegas was exiting its infancy, showing the beginnings of the city we see today. But some felt it needed more. It needed a brand that was unlike any other in the world. Las Vegans were only made aware of the impending tests two weeks before the first detonation. Although some were understandably concerned about the possible dangers of the nuclear activity nearby, a major government publicity campaign and the potential for the increased publicity, and thus, increased business, quelled many of their misgivings. As they had done with the construction of the Boulder Dam more than 20 years prior, Las Vegans jumped at the chance to market themselves as a tourist attraction. As they had once touted their city as the gateway to the Boulder Dam, Las Vegans began promoting their hometown as the Atomic City. Days after the first bomb was detonated on January 27, 1951, the Las Vegas Chamber of Commerce issued a stream of press releases excitedly describing the new testing grounds as one of the many attractions Las Vegas had to offer. As one official described, the angle was to get people to think the explosions wouldn't be anything more than a gag. After the April 22nd televised broadcast of the bomb, 
atomic culture swept the nation, and Las Vegas became the epicenter of the craze, leading to what New York Times would refer to as the non-ancient but nonetheless honorable pastime of atom bomb watching. The Vegas Chamber of Commerce promoted in advance the dates and times for these tests. Calendars and community announcements would be published months in advance for tourists to plan and enjoy the spectacle of the mushroom cloud. Photos of these events began circulating across news sources everywhere, and bomb watching became such a rage that thrill-seeking tourists would try to make sure to get the closest spot possible to ground zero. On the eve of the detonations, many Las Vegas businesses held dawn bomb parties, which often took place on rooftops and would include such specialty drinks as the atomic cocktail. Beginning at midnight, guests would drink and sing until the flash of the bomb lit up the night sky. Any north-facing penthouse suites went for far more money, as these had a better view of the explosions. And if you needed a break from the existential, potentially society-collapsing power of the atom bomb, they had plenty of gambling, games, and shows for you to turn your attention and wallets toward instead. And before long, the viewing experiences weren't just limited to the casino rooftops. Viewing sites would begin popping up all around the area, like Mount Charlestown, just a few miles from Vegas. Chartered bus services transported viewers to these locations, and ticket costs included lunches, cocktails, and of course, lots of protective eyewear, allowing people to see the late night or early morning blast turn night into day. It wasn't all good, though. Some within the government didn't have fears about the effects of testing radioactive weapons of mass destruction near large population centers. For a time, schools in the surrounding area issued dog tags to children in the event that something went wrong. For 12 years, an average of one bomb every three weeks was detonated, at a total of 235 bombs. Flashes from the explosions were so powerful that some could be reportedly seen as far away as Montana. Scientists at the time claimed that the radiation's harmful effects would have dissipated and have been harmless once the shock waves reached Las Vegas. And to their credit, they scheduled tests to coincide with weather patterns that blew fallout away from the city. However, as the tests continued, people in northeastern Nevada and southern Utah began complaining that their pets and livestock were suffering from beta particle burns and other ailments. But in addition to generating tourism, the Nevada test site, where the nukes were detonated, also brought thousands of military personnel, thousands of jobs, and more than $176 million in federal funds to the region, two-thirds of which went directly back into Las Vegas' economy. However, this couldn't last forever. Atmospheric nuclear testing ended in 1963 after the Limited Test Ban Treaty. The Department of Energy continued to detonate underground nuclear devices at the Nevada test site until 1992, when the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty finally put an end to testing. After the nuclear spectacle ceased, Las Vegas did what it had done 12 years earlier and pivoted to emphasizing the next big attractions. They had squeezed all they could out of the tests while they could, and the city was far better for it. As one casino owner put it, the best thing to happen to Vegas was the atomic bomb. Thanks for watching. This was part of my series on the Atoms for Peace movement. Essentially, when the government tried to jazz up the image of nuclear bombs to the public and get them more comfortable with the idea of putting tons of money into developing thousands of them as the Cold War with the Soviet Union was kicking off. If you want to see more of my videos on this topic, click the link at the end of this video. Thanks again, and I will see you in the next one.